in her head ill. Oh, no, lady, don't say that. There are plenty of good, sane reasons to shoot another person, and I'm sure Babe had one. This is the AK-47 assault rifle, the preferred weapon of your enemy, and it makes a distinctive sound when fired at you, so remember it. That was the big guy, Clint Eastwood, telling the Marines to shape up or else make his day. I'm Rex Reed. And I'm Bill Harris. And we're going to make your day with a special look at Crimes of the Heart. That's because you are at the movies. just sit there and bleed a while before you taste some real pain. Blank-faced, granite-jawed, two-fisted Clint Eastwood is back in Heartbreak Ridge. This is good news, of course, for big Clint's fans, but excruciating for anyone who is interested in things like plot, characterization, and good sense. In this pointless exercise in escapist brutality, the big guy plays Tom Highway, a rough-talking, hard-drinking marine hero who's been to Korea and Vietnam. Well, the war is over now. In fact, all the wars are over, but Big Clint is an artifact, so he starts a new war of his own, this time on the drill field, where he's assigned to train a reconnaissance platoon for future battle. Here he is, stoic as Mount Rushmore, a brawling, fighting combat vet who finds himself taking orders from young officers who have never battled anything but a filing cabinet and in charge of a bunch of sloppy recruits who are criminals, jerks, hustlers, and jarheads. That's all you really need to know about the plot. Most of the movie consists of scenes like this one, in which old Rockface takes on the wusses and wimps and knocks a few skulls together in a voice that sounds like a battery-operated vibrator. The Marines are looking for a few good men. Unfortunately, you ain't it. Now we will blaze a path into battle for others to follow. Surrender is not in our creed. Let's hear you say that. Surrender is not in our creed. Louder, next time you leave this base for R&R, &R, you'll be collecting your pensions. Surrender is not in our creed. Louder. Surrender is not in our creed. Hoorah. When the talk subsides and the real bullets fly, it's not on Heartbreak Ridge, but it's on the Caribbean resort island of Grenada, where the Marines machine gun a large number of innocent banana trees. Cover my... when the smoke does clear, Big Clint emerges another hero, scars by Max Factor and jawline by Kaiser Aluminum. The recruits respect him, even Marsha Mason takes him back, and she hates him. Nobody ever bothers to explain why. I guess there's not much time for logic when you're trying to mouth the gung-ho macho minestrone that this movie calls dialogue and run for mayor of Carmel, California at the same time. Now, John Wayne might have found some humor in all this, but Clint Eastwood doesn't even try. He doesn't act. He just frowns, cusses, and growls. The fans, of course, don't care as long as the brass knuckles still work. But the military cares. This movie was originally written about the Army. Well, they read the script, and they refused to have anything to do with it. Then Clint Eastwood changed it to the Marines, who have since disowned it, and they've even canceled the world premiere of the movie, which was supposed to benefit the Marine charities. Now, I'm telling you, when you make a movie so bad it even makes the Marines want to throw up, you've hit rock bottom. I don't blame them. Heartbreak Ridge left me in a stupor, like waking up in the middle of the night in front of a TV test pattern. Why did something tell me that my partner wasn't going to like this one? It started great. Images black and white of old war, World War II, and so forth in Korea. Country legend uh, Don Gibson, Sea of Heartbreak. And then, wham! Oh, but and we've seen it a million times. Of course times. we've seen it. that we Richard that. Brooks made much better called Take the High Ground, in which Richard Widmark played the Clint Eastwood part. 
much better picture. Just go back and see that one. And Filthy well, dialogue. They, what they had the slang script? words to parts of my body I didn't know I had. <laughs> and had suggestions about what to do with them that I, I can't do physically. And but that also, growling the, voice. The voice what was real to his voice. Right face. But forward. But you can't hear that in a movie theater, way much less on a drill field. Sending him to Grenada, by the way, is like John Wayne breaking oh, up a fight at recess. Show. That's no war. Next, three sisters, kooky sisters, reunited when one of them is accused of shooting her husband in Mississippi. Hey, and give each one of us a Once in a blue moon, a flawless little gem comes along to restore my faith in movies. And Crimes of the Heart is one of them. It's a delicate candy valentine based on Beth Henley's Pulitzer Prize winning play and deliciously acted by Diane Keaton, Jessica Lange, and Sissy Spacek. There's real drama and poetry in it and rowdy humor, too. It's the wacky story of the McGrath sisters, three disaster-prone eccentrics who live in a crumbling old gingerbread house in Hazelhurst, Mississippi. They've been off-center, of course, ever since their mama hung herself in the family cat in the fruit cellar in a double suicide. And now Lenny, the oldest sister, is a shy old maid with a deformed ovary. Meg, she ran away to Hollywood and ended up in the loony bin. And Babe, the baby of the family, faces 30 years in jail for shooting her husband in the stomach after having an affair with a black teenager. Their own cousin calls them cheap Christmas trash. But are they depressed? Not for a minute. Like modern-day Scarlett O'Hara's, they postpone all realities till another day. These girls are survivors because they stick together. But sibling rivalry goes all the way back to childhood, and sometimes it erupts over the oddest things, like a box of chocolates. Well, I just wanted to, I just wanted to ask, I just wanted to ask him just why, why did you take one little bite out of each piece of candy in this box and then just put it right back in there? I was looking for the ones with nuts. The ones with nuts? Uh-huh. Well, there are none with nuts. This is a box of assorted creams. All it has in it are creams. Meg, if you please yes. look right here at the top of this box, it says right here in clear letters, assorted creams, not nuts. And besides, I want to tell you something. It was my one and only birthday present to me. It was my only one. Well, Lenny, honey, I'll get you another one. Well, that's not the point. I don't want another box. What is the point? Well, the point, I just, well, okay, I don't know what the point is. It's just that you just have no respect for other people's property. You're just always taking whatever you want. Well, do you remember how you always had layers and layers of jingle bells sewn onto your petticoats while Babe and I only had three and pink? She's going on about those stupid jingle bells again. Well, that's why, Mike, because it's a specific example of how you always got what you wanted. Babe decides to end it all and repeat history just like her mama did, but in one of the film's funniest scenes proves she's oh even God. too clumsy to kill herself. What the hell have you done? Oh, nothing. Yeah. Oh, baby. Come here now. Just sit down. Just sit back over here. Oh. Yeah. Well, that was just like the Meg. I'm okay. Here, put your head Meg. between your knees now, please. Meg. 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 Crimes of the Heart, you know, it really is a hard movie to describe. You have to see it, and you have to absorb it to get its true flavor. It's got no conventional plot, yet its characters just move into your heart and set up housekeeping. It has a rhythm of its own, and it lifts you up, it plunks you down, and it carries you right off on its wings. Now, to accomplish all of that, that requires great ensemble playing, and here it is beautifully served by a trio of actresses who are positively mesmerizing. As Meg, the sister who got away, Jessica Lang is a perfect contrast to her down-home siblings. She's got a hard edge and a kind of tough veneer to her character. As Lenny, the spinster, Diane Keaton is nervous, she's clunky, she's simmering with rage all the time. And as Babe, the flamboyant baby of the family, Sissy Spacek, is utterly mad, impulsive, and full of misplaced passion. They're all adorable. 
Well, maybe all Southern Bells are not this off the wall, but I wish they were. And I also wish that every movie was as funny and as irresistible as Crimes of the Heart. I cannot remember when we have been so much in sync. When, what a rave, what a fun... And the addition of Tess Harper makes it oh, a quadruple so treat. Good, yeah. She's wonderful, She's too. She's like Sister Woman, you know, in, in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. She's there, and she, so the three together, you know, you know you're going in with a big triple threat movie, but the heart and the story, this is as good as it gets. And they have a wonderful feeling for the cadence of how Southern women sound, because I went to school with girls who sound just like that. And every time there's a crisis, which there is every ten minutes in this movie, they're popping popcorn, they're having hot cocoa, they're putting everything off till another day. Mm -hmm. You know, Next I think, time I think it's around. so charming. There's a funny moment when the two, two of the sisters are looking through a book called The Diseases of the skin <laughs> that they used when they were children. Oh, it's just wonderful. I was real happy with this one. Coming up next, an exclusive interview with two of the stars, Sissy Spacek and Jessica Lang, from Crimes of the Heart. It's Crimes of the Heart, and once again, it is sensational. So are the performances by the ladies. In fact, don't be surprised if you see one or several of them up there for Oscars. We had a chance to speak with Sissy Spacek and Jessica Lang. In fact, Sissy's already being mentioned for possible Oscar for Night Mother. I said, I'm sorry, Jesse. I can't fix it all for you. I said I'd always love you. This is the other thing I'm trying. And I know there's some other things that might work, but my work's not good enough anymore. I need something that will work. This will work. Leave me alone. It's the truth. I should have just left you a note. Yeah. I was impressed with Night Mother, and it must have been a real emotional roller coaster to do that and to try to have a personal life, too. Oh, I didn't try to have a personal life, too. Um, that was, that, that was, uh, all I did then. <laughs> and a real emotional ordeal. Yeah. How did you blow out steam when it was finally done? I, uh, I played babe and shot my husband. <laughs> Correct. You just pulled the trigger. What happens now? Well, after I shot him, I put the gun down on the piano bench and went out to the kitchen and made up a pitcher of lemonade. Lemonade? Yes. I was dying at first. No. Lemonade? No. Would you like a Coke instead? You described Babe McGrath once as a woman who has a dinner party and is a wonderful centerpiece and everything is right. Except she forgets to put the roast in the oven. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Beth Henley, who wrote this, mm -hmm. described her to me that way. Because when I, um, I, I saw her out in Los Angeles while I was making Night Mother, and I was, you know, was kind of desperate because I was in such an emotional state at that point that I just thought, how in the world am I going to be able to do a comedy? At this? I just, my psyche was not in a comedic place. So I was like, Beth. Tell me something about the character, please. And that's what she said. She's a, that really kind of just Put it opened my there. eyes about about Babe. Why would you tell anyone about you, Zachary? Oh, well, you must have had a good reason, didn't you? I guess I did. Well, then, Babe, what was the reason? I can't say. Oh, Babe, why not? Well, I'm sort of... I'm sort of protecting someone. Oh, then you mean you didn't really shoot him? <laughs> no, I shot him all right. Oh, I meant to kill him. Oh, I was aiming for his heart, but I guess my hands are shaking and I just got him in the stomach. So I'm guilty all right, and I'm just going to have to take my punishment and go on to jail. Oh, babe, well, don't worry. The jail's going to be a relief for me. I can learn to play my saxophone. I won't have to live with Zachary anymore. And I won't have this snoopy old sister Lucille coming over and pushing me around. It must be a real rarity to have three Oscar-winning actresses working, having fun. The fun seems infectious, was it there? It was, it really was. Because we all got along great. Somehow, there was no tension between us. Which, I think, was a real important element to creating that kind of warmth and love between us on screen. And, uh... For some reason, we all just fell into this easy way of being with each other. We got very lucky. I mean, there was, no, there was nothing in the production that kind of um, offset it, you know? There was nothing that created any, any problems. Okay, Dad. 
Because, you know, I think you bring to the screen then something that is unspoken. Some subtleties or complexities of a relationship that you don't have to work to create. They're just there. And with this situation and also with country, I mean, we were people who had like a long history together, who had an intimate knowledge of each other. And it just seems to me that, they, you know, it, it makes the relationship on screen Richer somehow. Sam Shepard, of course, just like his real-life fella, another surprise in a film that is a winner. Rex and I agree, and it's a pleasure to be able to present a look at Sissy and Jessica backstage with you. Coming up, another serious film, the camaraderie and the struggle for survival amid terrifying violence in Vietnam. It's a film called Platoon. Somebody once wrote, hell is the impossibility of reason. That's what this place feels like, hell. I think I've made a big mistake coming here. to warn you, Platoon is a tough, tough film for everyone. Writer and director Oliver Stone has told the story of Vietnam as he saw it. He was there. But in one sense or another, so were we all. As hawks or doves or participants or protesters, Vietnam somehow didn't miss a single one of us. Charlie Sheen stars in this one as a college dropout and a gung-ho volunteer. His father and his granddad both signed up in their day. But this is a different day. It's a different war. Tom Berenger and Willem Dafoe are both veteran vet sergeants who have radically different approaches to the fighting and to the foe. Platoon is tough and gritty. It is uncomfortable in its realism. But Charlie Sheen is one of those who wanted to be there. Hey, Taylor. How did you get here anyway? Hey, you look educated. I volunteered for it. You do what? I volunteered. I dropped out of college and told him I wanted the infantry combat in Vietnam. You volunteered for this man? Believe that? You the crazy. Giving up college? Didn't make much sense. I wasn't learning anything. I figured why should just the poor kids go off to war and the rich kids always get away with it. Oh, I see. What we got here is a crusader. <laughs> Sounds like it. No, what we got here are performances that are rock solid. At times, spellbinding from all three of our stars. With the release of Platoon, creator Oliver Stone has seemingly cleansed his soul of Vietnam. But he's put it back on the audience, on us, many of whom don't want to be reminded. Many would prefer to forget the constant profanity of word and deed. It's in the film. The graphic killing and suffering in the film. The drug use that turned some men into zombies. And the body bags that turned other men into statistics. Platoon left me exhausted and discontent. I didn't like it so much as respect it. It is surely not entertainment so much as statement. The message is powerful. The movie's unsettling. It is not for everyone. It's a reminder that war is hell and that somehow Vietnam was even worse. I admired the brutal realism in this picture, but the message that Vietnam was a war in which everybody lost and that we're going to be paying for it the rest of our lives, it's an old message. It was done so much better in Hearts and Minds, that wonderful Oscar-winning documentary that showed the same things and that this movie shows, the My Lai Massacre, what Lieutenant Callie did, taking peasants and raping the children and putting guns to the heads of old no, women I mean, and blowing their brains out. Right. How much longer are we going to be asked to pay money to feel guilty about Vietnam. The American people were not responsible for Vietnam. We didn't want it. We didn't vote for it. And I'm sick of movies about it. And I don't recommend this movie to anybody. Now, let's recap the movies we reviewed on this show. 
Clint Eastwood's mindless marine adventure Heartbreak Ridge, well, it was disowned by the Marines and by me. This one ranks only one star from me. Bill liked the usual Big Clint charisma, despite that gravelly voice, and so he gives it two stars. But the warm Southern comedy Crimes of the Heart with Jessica Lange, Sissy Spacek, and Diane Keaton, well, that gets plaudits from us both. Four stars from me, highest rating. And another four stars from Bill. You'll rarely see that on this show. Now, I felt the Vietnam melodrama platoon was honest and real, but almost too real for general viewing audiences and certainly not an entertainment. Another agreement here. Two stars from me and two stars from Bill. Huh, two agreements. No such promises next week when we review Jane Fonda's new movie, The Morning After, plus an interview with Jane Fonda herself. And we'll be looking at the new rock musical comedy, Little Shop of Horrors. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. And I'm Rex Reed. But first, before we go, we'd like to add our own tribute to the late Cary Grant, a man whose passing signified not only the end of a great career, but the end of an entire era of elegance in the movies. And now we're going to show you some film clips that maybe will trigger some of your own memories. What's wrong with you? No, what? Nothing. <laughs>